This is the last Torah portion of the year. Next week, we start with Bereshit. Now, let me ask you this. Every year in Israel, during the Feast of Sukkot or Tabernacles, there's fervent prayer for what? Rain. There are desert. Uh, it's on the same latitude as Scottsdale, Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, it's a desert. And uh, there's like no rain. So come September, October, they really start praying for rain. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 2. This is from last week's Torah portion. But here's what you have to notice. God says, my doctrine, God is speaking. In other words, my laws, my orders are going to drop as what? Not like the hurricane. Okay, that's the important thing. It's, it's not going to be with 80 mile an hour winds. As a matter of fact, look at the next one. My speech will distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender grass, as the showers upon the herb. So it's like this nice little gentle rain that you would like the perfect amount. It doesn't destroy the crops. Okay, it actually waters the crops. And so we see rain is really to be considered a blessing. If you remember when I was teaching in the Song of Songs, what did he say? You know, it's raining outside. My head is filled with the dew. He wanted her to come out and be blessed. Okay, so that's a huge difference. Well, get a load of Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. It says, let us know and eagerly strive to know the Lord. Now, I think that's interesting. You stop right there. People say, well, I know the Lord. Yeah, well, I also knew President Reagan, but I didn't know President Reagan, but I, I knew President Reagan. Okay. Well, it says, don't all, not only know the Lord, but eagerly strive to know the Lord. In other words, it's all about a personal relationship. It's not about just an acknowledgement of beliefs because the devil believes in God fervently. That's why he's so worried. And then it says, his going forth is sure as the morning. And look at this. He's going to come to us as what? The rain, the latter rain that waters the earth. Okay, so the former rain actually is in the spring. The latter rain is in the fall. So we're, you know, we're not praying for the latter rain of spring, but for the latter rain of the fall. And so what we have to realize, Messiah's first coming and second comings are both following the rainy seasons. Do you see the connection? He says, look, I'm coming as rain, which means the spring feast and the fall feast. And look at Zechariah 14.9. It says the Lord will be king over all the earth. Oh, wait a minute. I skipped a verse. Ezekiel 34, 26. God says, and I will make them and the places around about my hill a blessing. Remember, this is the Torah portion. This is the blessing. So it's important to know what God considers a blessing. How many of you know oftentimes what we consider a blessing ends up not being a blessing? I really wish I had a boat. And then uh, eight years later, I really wish I could get rid of this boat. You know what I mean? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, so let's look at what God considers a blessing. He says, I will cause the shower to come down in its appointed time, and there will be showers of blessing. So, you know, up here in the Northwest, we have lots of rain, lots of showers, and it's a blessing. The reason why we have lots of showers is we have lots of trees. It's called the rain cycle. You know, if people want rain, they better start planting trees. And now look at Zechariah 14, 9. It says, the Lord is going to be king over all the earth, and that day the Lord will be one, and his name one, Akkad. But look what happens next. It has to do with where we are right now today. It says in Zechariah 14, 16, and 17, it'll come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem, they have to go up from year to year and worship the king when he's king over all the earth, and the Lord of hosts, or the Lord of armies, and they have to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it'll be whoever of the families of the earth 
that don't go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, upon them will be what? No rain. Rain is a blessing. If you have no rain for several years, you're in trouble. Okay. Now, we know God is not bipolar. I think we can assume that. Okay. God doesn't say the Feast of Tabernacles is good. For the last 2,000 years, it's horrible, but pretty soon it'll be good again. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, so we ought to always be keeping the appointed time so we can learn from them. You can learn, you can read a book all about how riding a bicycle, how to ride a bicycle, but it's not until you get on the bicycle that you really learn. Just like people go to college, learn how to be an architect, but they've never lifted a hammer. Okay, and then all of a sudden they go to start and they stumble and everything because on the field job training is so much better than in school training. This is why we actually don't just study the feast, we do the feast. So let's begin our Torah portion now. In Deuteronomy 33 verse 1, it says, This is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel just before he died. Well, guess what? Just before Yeshua ascended into heaven, the last thing he did was bless the people. Look at Luke 24, verse 50 and 51. He led them out until they were over against Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. When it says he lifted up his hand, did he do this? No, he did this. Okay, he was saying the priestly blessing from Numbers chapter 6, and it says he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. One thing that's amazing about that verse, whenever the priests would say the priestly blessing, they would raise their hands like this, forming the letter Shin of Shaddai, because God says he will put his name upon them. So they're putting his name upon you when they do that. Well, what's amazing Right before he ascended, he raises his hands to bless them. And what do they see? The nail holes in his hands. Well, every Jew, when the blessing is going to be said, they look down because the blessing of God is coming upon them. So as soon as he did that, they look down. And what do they see? The holes in his feet. So they're looking at the holes in his feet. And all of a sudden, his feet start going up in the air. And I can just see them watching his feet uh, as they go up. Now, in... Deuteronomy 33, 24. Okay, this has to do with the blessing here. He said, the Lord came from Sinai. He rose from Seir to them. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones. And then it says, at his right hand was a fiery law. So I've got this picture up here of his hand, in both hands, but there's the Torah, and it's a fiery Torah. We're going to talk about that, but it's a fiery law. He says he, at his right hand was a fiery law for them. So he's giving them a gift. And then it says he loves the people. All his holy ones are in your hand. Wow. We're to be the... Fiery laws in one hand, and all of his people are in the other hand. Unless we're in the same hand as the fiery law. And then it says, what did they do? They sat down at your feet. Each one is receiving from your words. Moses commanded us a Torah, which was an inheritance for the assembly of Jacob. Wow. Wow. I mean, a lot of people, they, they can hardly wait to get their inheritance <laughs> or a heritage. God considers the Torah, which is on fire, as the greatest inheritance he can give you. Think about that. This is your inheritance. Because God says, you know, basically, I'm here forever. I want to give you inheritance right now. And the greatest inheritance I have for you is my instruction. Why in the world would we want to throw out our inheritance that just, it doesn't make sense. So the law is considered a blessing, it says. It's a blessing. And it's a law that is given by the king, and it is given out of love. Your inheritance, he says, is my Torah. Wow. And we know the word of God is forever. If you look at Matthew, 
chapter 15, 29 and 30, Yeshua went from there and he came to the Sea of Galilee and he went up into the mountain and he took his seat there. And there came to him great numbers of people having with them those who were broken in body or blind or without voice or wounded or ill in any way. And a number of others, they put them down where? At his feet and he made them well. So just like at Mount Sinai, here Yeshua comes and they all bring the wounded to his feet. And he is the word of God, speaking the word of God, and it is having an effect. Now, at the end of Sukkot is Simchat Torah, which means rejoicing in the Torah. We're, spelled, we're commanded to rejoice all during the feast. Well, Shemini Atzeret, which I'll be talking about the second half, which is that eighth day, has very special meaning, and they celebrate Simchat Torah that same day in Israel, but it's a different day outside of Israel. So think about them. They're sitting down at his feet, and what is he doing? Teaching them, right? Look at John. If you remember in John chapter 7, it was the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's when he stood up and said, yes, as the scripture says, if any man thirsts, let him come to me, and out of his belly will flow rivers of living water, right? Okay. And in John 8, the very next day after the whole adulterous woman thing, or I mean, that's happening here in John 8, it says Yeshua went out to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Wow. Again. This is just like Deuteronomy. This is the blessing. Here he's there in the temple teaching, and people are sitting down at his feet. And then what's amazing, this is the very day. If, uh, in chapter 7, it was the last day of the feast, which is the seventh day. This next day is the very day they're supposed to be rejoicing in the Torah, and the Pharisees bring the Torah to kill this adulterous woman. So you, you got to make the connection of what's going on. So he not only taught them from the book, he taught them as they watch how he handled that situation. Well, all of this was fulfilling a prophecy in Isaiah. Look at chapter 30, verse 20 and 21. It says, and though the Lord will give you the bread of trouble and the water of grief, you will no longer put your teacher on one side but you're going to see your teacher. And in Hebrew, it's the Aleph Tov teacher, the beginning and the end. And at your back, when you are turning to the right hand or to the left, there will be a voice sounding in your ears saying, this is the way in which you are to go. Well, it's interesting. The title, the teacher, was actually a messianic title. They knew the Messiah came, they would call him the teacher because he would explain all of the riddles and the things that people didn't understand. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, it suggests also one of the Messianic titles for the Messiah would be the teacher. Now, about his word, what does it say? In Jeremiah 23, 29, is not my word like what? A fire. That's what it is. And so this is why in Deuteronomy, it says there was a fiery law because the law is his word. And also it's like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. So what we have to see though, look at Proverbs 6, 23. The commandment is a lamp and the law is what? A light. That's why it's a fiery law. It's bringing light. Then we see in Deuteronomy <clears throat> chapter 33, verse 5, God was king in Yeshurun. Now, Yeshurun is a nickname for Jacob, Israel, and it means blessed. This whole book or chapter is about the blessing, and he's a blessed one. It says, when the heads of the people were gathered and all the tribes of Israel came together. Well, at Sukkot, that's when everyone has to come together. But let's look how this verse goes on in verse 13 through 16. What he's doing, he's blessing every one of the 12 tribes. And he says, of Joseph, blessed of the Lord be his land. 
for the, notice, I think this is incredible. It's for the precious things of heaven, for the dew, for the deep that couches beneath, and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills, and for the precious things of the earth and fullness thereof, and for the goodwill of him that dwelled in the bush, let the blessing come on the head of Joseph and on the top of him, uh, the top of the head of him that was separated from his brothers. I think it's fascinating because Yeshua also was separated from his brothers. In John 7, they didn't believe in him, okay, concerning his literal physical brothers, and then also his brothers, the nation of Israel. A lot of them rejected him as well. Now, here's something that is really amazing in light of what happened this year. And that goes exactly with my book, America at War. Tishri begins with what day? The first, but the first of Tishri is Rosh Hashanah. And what does Rosh Hashanah mean? I can't hear. Rosh. What is Rosh? Head. Hashanah, the year. That is so important, the wording. Words mean something. It means the head of the year, not necessarily the, I mean, it is the first of the year, but more important than the first, it's the head of the year. It's not just the beginning of the year. It is the nerve center of the year. It is always a harbinger of what is coming. Okay, it's the head. Think of the head, not the foot. And this year, on Rojajana, Iran shot all these ballistic missiles at Israel, which is telling you we're entering a year of the war cycle. There's a time for peace and a time for war. And I'm telling you, this year that we're in right now, we're going to see war like we've never seen before because it was triggered on the head of the year, the nerve center. So you need to be thinking about that. Rosh Hashanah is the head of the year spiritually, and Yom Kippur is the heart of the year. Okay? Now, in Deuteronomy 33, 26 to 29, it says, There is none like God, Yeshurun, he rides on the heavens for your help. In his excellency on the skies, the eternal God is your dwelling place. And here it is. Underneath are the everlasting arms. How many of you want to be there? Okay. He thrusts out the enemy from before you and said, destroy. Israel dwells in safety, the fountain of Jacob alone, and a land of grain and new wine. Yes, his heavens drop down dew. You are happy, Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help, the sword of your excellency. Your enemies will submit themselves to you, and you are going to tread on their high places. And then here's a little picture of this next verse. I'm just going to see where I'm at. Yeah. Who knows where this is? I've been there. Anyone else? You've been there? This is the exact spot where Moses looked into the promised land before he died. This is Mount Nebo. I took this picture when I was there, and it kind of shows you where Hebron is, what direction Bethlehem is, Ramallah, Nabula, Jericho, okay, type Sea of Galilee. But from this spot, it tells you how far away all these different places are, and so you can Kind of look at exactly everything Moses saw. Nothing's really changed here since then. It's amazing. And it says in Deuteronomy 34, 1, that Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. This is it. My frustration, it's always cloudy. <laughs> I wish I could. It's kind of like here, comets go by and everything. We can't ever see anything. But look at verse 4 and 5. The Lord says to Moses, Hey, this is the land of which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I've caused you to see it with your eyes, but you're not crossing over. 
And so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And then verse 6 and 7, it says, he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beit Peor. And no one knows of his sepulcher to this day. And so Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim and his natural force, nor his natural force abated. Why do you think no one knows of where his sepulcher is or where he's buried? They'd make a god out of him and create a, you know, yeah. So that's why. Now look at verse 8 through 12. So the children of Israel wept for Moses for 30 days. And when the days of mourning for Moses ended, Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the children listened to what he said, did as the Lord commanded. But since there has not arisen a prophet like Moses since then, who the Lord knew face to face, in all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and in all his land, by all that mighty power and all that great terror, which Moses performed in the sight of Israel. Okay, so the Jews have always been looking for a Messiah that would be a prophet like Moses, right? That's what this is saying. Well, what's amazing, Moses wrote the word of God, which is, Yeshua's words, okay, so why would Christians think Yeshua is going to change his own word? He wouldn't be the prophet like Moses. Now, the Hoff Torah portion, which means a portion of the prophets that ties into this Torah portion, is this is always read during Sukkot. Why? The events are supposed to happen during Sukkot. Make connections here. Ezekiel 38, 39, along with Zechariah 12 through 14, have been the Haftorah portions during the Feast of Tabernacles. Could these be implications of when these victories will take place? Gog will come against Israel during the Feast of the Seventh Month. Now look at Ezekiel 38, 1 through 3. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, Prophesy against him and say, thus saith the Lord God. Behold, I'm against you, O God, the chief prince of Meshach and Tuval. Well, look at Deuteronomy 22.8. When you build a new house, you should make a battlement for your, what? Guess what the Hebrew word for roof is? Gog. Gog means roof. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But. If you remember, what did Israel do? What does Israel do every Sukkot? What do they do? They sacrifice 70 bulls. Why do they sacrifice 70 bulls? The 70 nations of the world. Well, guess what? Magog and Gog, I have the numerical value underneath, equals 70 because Gog Magog refers to all the nations that are going to come against Jerusalem. That's what Gog Magog means. But it also means a roof. And so what happens? We are to be living in a sukkah during Sukkot, whereas everyone else wants to have this big roof. They can't see the heavens. They can't see God. It protects them from God's hail and rain and everything else. So what this really is, the Gog and Magog war, is going to be a war between those who seek God's protection versus those who seek man-made protection. That's what this season is all about. How many of you would like to be living in an 18-story high-rise when the big earthquake happens, or would you rather be outside in your little sukkah? That's the place to be when everything is falling over. Okay, so... What this is about, the battle of the strong house with a prideful roof against the humility of the sukkah with its weak, unstable covering. The whole history of mankind consists of this contrast. Is our security found in what we can build or is it in trusting God? So we see in Ezekiel chapter 38, 18 through 20. It'll come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, says the Lord, my fury will come up in my face, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. 
Surely in that day there will be a great shaking in the land of Israel. The fishes of the sea, the fowls of heaven, and the beasts of the field, and all the creepy crawlers, and all the men that are upon the face of the earth will shake at my presence. The mountains will be thrown down. The steep places fall. Every wall will fall to the ground. And it's going to happen during Sukkot. And do you want to be in your sukkah or in your house when every wall is falling to the ground? And then we see in Ezekiel 38, 22, and 23. I will plead against him with pestilence and blood. I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon his many people that are with him and overflowing rain, great hailstones, fire, brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself sanctify myself and guess what then i will be known in the eyes of many nations and they're going to know that i am the lord this is just like egypt he says then pharaoh and all of egypt will know that i am the lord when i do these things and then ezekiel 39 17 through 21 he says and you son of man thus says the lord speak to every feathered fowl every beast of the field Assemble and come gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I'm sacrificing for you. Even a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel. And he says, you get it. Come to the wedding supper of the lamb. You get to eat flesh, drink blood. You're going to eat the flesh of the mighty, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, lambs, goats, bullocks, all of them, the fatted calves of Bashan. You will eat fat till you're full and drink blood till you're drunken of my sacrifice, which I sacrifice for you. Thus you will be filled at my table with horses and chariots, mighty men, with all the men of war, says the Lord God. And I will set my glory among the heathen and to all the heathen. They are going to see my judgment that I've executed in my hand that I have laid on them. Well, this is the Gog Magog war. Well, look at Revelation 19, 17 and 18. I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the middle of heaven, come and gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God that you can eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, flesh of mighty men, horses of them that sit on them, the flesh of all men, free and bond, small and great. Okay, what is this telling us? The Gog Magog War is at the end of the tribulation. So many people think the Gog Magog War is at the beginning. It's not at the beginning. It's not in the middle. It's the last thing before he returns. And so everybody gets to go to the wedding supper. It's just a matter of what side of the table are you on? Are you eating or being eaten? But everyone gets to come to the marriage supper. Now, what happens after the thousand year millennial reign, look at Revelation 27 and 9. When the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison. He'll go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. And he's going to gather them to battle again. And the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breath of the earth, compassed the camp of the saints, the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So there are two Gog Magog wars. One at the beginning of the millennial reign, when all the nations come, and then believe it or not, when the Lord himself is here for a thousand years, people are still going to rebel. People would think, oh my goodness, if Jesus was here right now, everyone would behave. No, they wouldn't. Especially the rebellious whose heart is rebellious. They're just going to be upset that they're being watched over more closely. That's why at the end of the millennial reign, all these people are still going to come against the Lord when he's been living amongst them for a thousand years. And then look at Jeremiah 34, 8. It says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people that were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty to them. What does it tell you? What is this telling you when Zedekiah makes a covenant to proclaim liberty? What? The biblical calendar. It's a Shemitah year. You proclaim liberty Every Shemitah year, you also do in the year of Jubilee, but every Shemitah year, they are to proclaim liberty. Okay, now, why is this important? Look at Ezekiel 40 and verse 1. It says, in the 25th year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was smitten, in the selfsame day, the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me there. Okay, gave you all this information. What day is it? What time is it? Okay, it's the 25th year of our captivity. 
but it's also the beginning of the year, and it's also the 10th of the month, and it's also the 14th year after the city was smitten. How would you like to put all those together? I already did it. Okay, in my book, America at War. <laughs> Here it is. It's the year 3350 from Adam, okay? And Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar, hauled him off to Babylon, and he puts King Zedekiah in charge. It's the year 3350. This is when the captivity began that he's talking about. And so if you see, it was the 25th year of our captivity. You add 3350 and 28, it takes you to what? 33, okay, 78. Now, watch this. We go to the next thing, and it says... It was the beginning of the year, Rosh Hashanah, the 10th day of the month, Yom Kippur, okay, we know it was a Shemitah year, okay, well, so now we're coming closer, we're going to find out right here, Yom Kippur, Ezekiel 41 is happening in the transition from 3374 going into 3375. So it is the last, it's the end of this transitioning into this next year. Some people believe that was a Jubilee year. It was not, it could not, it cannot be. Okay, so here it is. It's in a Shemitah year. He's proclaiming the year of liberty at the end of it, going into the year 3375. And you'll find out it was the 14th year after the city was smitten, and the temple was destroyed in 3361, you add 14, again, it takes you to 3375. So all of these point to Yom Kippur going from 3374 into 3375. This is the Jubilee year, 3382 from Adam, uh, which is like 379, 378 B.C. But I just wanted to point out, it wasn't a jubilee year. Okay, so Joshua 1, 1 through 3, it says, After the death of Moses, it came to pass, the Lord spoke to Joshua, and he said, Look, Moses is dead. You get up, go over the Jordan, you and everyone else, to the land I'm giving to them. And so the children of Israel, uh, every place the sole of your foot will tread, I've given you, as I said, to Moses. And so here we have in Joshua 1, 6 through 9, be strong and courageous, you are going to cause these people to inherit the land that I swore to give them. Only be strong and very courageous to observe to do all of the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left, that you can have good success wherever you grow. This scroll of the Torah is not to depart out of your mouth. You're to meditate on it day and night that you can observe to do according to all that's written. Then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And then look at verse 16 through 18. The people answers Joshua and say, okay, all that you command us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go just as we listen to Moses. If I was Joshua, I'd go, oh, great. <laughs> you didn't listen to him very well. But then it says, only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against you, uh, against your command, and doesn't heed your words and all that you command him, let him be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. So now, since we're at the end of the Torah, we always begin again by reading the verse of Genesis that we will pick up next week. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And lastly, we close, since it's the end of the book, with these words. So let's all stand. And let's say this together. Kazakh, Kazakh, Venit, Kazakh. Be strong, be strong, and may we all be strengthened. Amen. Okay, so now everyone who has a lulav and a netrog, come on up. We're going to do this ceremony, then we'll take a break. Come on up, anybody with lulavs or etrogs?
Yay. Okay, we got it in the left hand. We got this in the right hand. And everybody, let's say the prayers together. Oh, and have the green part up. Yo, turn yours around. No, the yellow. There, like that. Perfect. Okay, together. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam. Asher Kitshanu Bi Mitzvotav Vitzivanu Al Netlat Lula. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us concerning the taking of the Lulav. Turn your etrog the other direction now. Turn this back up. And now we go face east three times. Oh, don't hurt yourself. Okay, one, two, three. And now south. One, two, three. And west. One, two, three. And north. One, two, three, and up. One, two, three, and down. One, two, three. Amen. Give them a big hand. They did awesome. Okay, let's close with prayer and we'll take a break. Avinu Malkainu, our Father King, we just thank you so much that we can all come together and rejoice in you. Make this be real in our hearts and not just head knowledge. We want heart knowledge. And Father, we just want to thank you for everything you're doing in this world today. We want to rejoice. And we just thank you for all of those who help take your Torah, magnify it, make it honorable once again. We just thank you for all those around the world, around the United States that are, and here locally, Father, that are bringing tithes and offerings in to help you succeed in what you want done. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, a creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord, our God. <clears throat> we are going to talk about Shamini Atzeret. And Shamini is the number eight. And at Seret means assembly. They were, after the seven days of Sukkot, they were required to assemble on the eighth day. One of the things that's interesting is here's how the eighth day is likened to. It's like, let's say you have a big party and you have your really close friends or cruelly close relatives come along with this big group of people and you have this big party and the party is over, everybody leaves and you've got this big mess to clean up, uh, you know, or you just want to take your breath and you invite some very close ones to stay that extra day that you can just fellowship with them away from all the crowds and it's more personal, more intimate. Uh, Shemini Atzeret, that day is what that is. It's like it's for all the nations, and then all the nations go home, and then his people stay there, and they build on that close relationship. That's what this is all about. The other thing is, what does the number eight signify? New beginnings, just like your octave in music. You go back to the beginning, uh, one sense, or it is a new beginning, it's a new era. As a matter of fact, Noah was the eighth person to step off the ark. Okay? Every, just like the captain of the ship is the last one to get off. There were eight on the ark, and he was the last one. He was the eighth person to get off the ark. Now, look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. It talks about how God did not spare the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a breach of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. When it says the eighth person, that means the eighth one to get off of the ark. Now, circumcision was always on the eighth day. And what was the importance of that? Well, look at Genesis chapter 17, verse 12. He that is eight days old will be circumcised among you, every male child in your generations, whether he's born in your house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of your seed. Okay, so what does that mean? The circumcision of the flesh, what does that speak of? 
Well, that was foreshadowing of the true circumcision of the heart that everyone has to go through. And it's that circumcision of the heart which was made without hands. Even the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Messiah. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. For in Messiah dwells all the wealth of God's being, has a living form, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all, rule and authority, and here it comes in whom you had a circumcision not made with hands, in the putting off of the body of the flesh, in the circumcision of the Messiah, having been put to death with him in baptism, by which you came to life again with him through faith in the working of God, who made him come back from the dead. So the whole concept of the eighth day, it's connected with a new creation. And it's the cutting off of all of our fleshly desires. So we're not walking in the flesh. We're walking in the spirit. But look at this. In Exodus 22, verse 29, you will not delay to offer the first of your ripe fruits and of your liquors, the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. Likewise shall you do with your ox, with your sheep. Seven days it shall be with its mom, but on the eighth day it's mine. So that refers to men and women. That doesn't matter, okay? The, it's always the eighth day. And this is why there are 7,000 years or seven days, and then comes the new heavens and the new earth. All of this is symbolizing that concept of everything will pass away, all things will become new. There's a new beginning that is coming. As a matter of fact... Any mathematicians out here? Eight is the first cube. Two times two times two. Of course, you have one times one times one, but eight is basically the first cube where the length and the breadth and the height are equal. This is significant because the significance of the cube is seen in the fact that the holy of holies, both in the tabernacle and in the temple, were cubes. And the tabernacle... It was a cube of 10 cubits. In the temple, the Holy of Holies was a cube of 20 cubits. If you look at 1 Kings 6, 19 and 20, it says the oracle he prepared in the house within to set there the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And the oracle in the forepart was 20 cubits in length, 20 cubits in breadth, 20 cubits in height. He overlaid with pure gold and so covered the altar with cedar. So the number eight, what's interesting, when you look at the gematria, notice that if you take all the names from Adam down to Noah and then his son Japheth, who was the oldest, it comes up to 3168, which is divisible by eight. If you take the sons of Noah, including Ham, you get 936, which is divisible by eight. But if you get rid of Ham, because he was the one that ended up being cursed, you get 888. Okay, so the number eight, if you go to Cain's line, it's all 13. Rebellion, rebellion, rebellion. Everything, there's, there's 13 and eight contrasting always in the names of those who are rebellious and their generations and those who are holy. Now, as I said, a cube of one was the window of the ark. A cube of 10 was the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. A cube of 20 or 8,000 cubits was the temple. And a cube of the new Jerusalem in Revelation is 172 billion, 800 million cubits. Okay, that's the new Jerusalem that is coming. Uh, Look at Revelation 21. Verse 14 through 17, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, in them the names of 12 Christian churches. Oh, no, no. 12 <laughs> popes. Nope, not 12 popes. 12 apostles. And he, ta- he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates and the wall. And the city was four square. And the length was as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and breadth and height are equal. It's a cube. Divisible by eight. And uh, like I said, the window in Noah's Ark, if you look at Genesis 6, 16, 
It says, a window you shall make of the ark, and it in a cubit shall you finish it. So it's just like a cubit by a cubit by a cubit. Now, if we look at Leviticus, am I already on Leviticus? Boy, this is going faster than I thought. I got to slow down. Okay, Leviticus 23, verse 36. Seven days you're to offer a firing offering to the Lord. And then look, here it is. On the eighth day, there's to be a holy convocation. Offer a fire offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. And that's the word, at Sarah. Okay, the, an assembly. So the eighth day or the eighth millennium, the eighth millennium, when there's the new heavens and the new earth, that's what is going to happen. What do we see in 2 Peter 3, 12 and 13? We're looking for and hasting to the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire will be dissolved. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness. We see that in Isaiah Chapter 34, 4, all the host of heaven is going to be dissolved. The heavens are going to be rolled together like a scroll, and all their host is going to fall down as the leaf falls from the vine and as the falling from the fig tree. I mean, I, I don't know about in your yard, but leaves are falling in my yard. You know, and can you imagine the stars falling like that all at once? You know, I mean, it's going to be something. Isaiah. 66, 22 through 24. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make will remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain from one new moon to a new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh will come and worship before me, declares the Lord. Do you realize what that means? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay. Keeping the new moon was good and it's still good and it will be good. Keeping the Sabbath was good, is good, and will still be good. But look at this. That means every month and every week, all flesh is going to come and worship before the Lord, and they get to go look into hell. Uh, they look at all the carcasses of the ones that have transgressed against me. Their worm won't die, neither will their fire be quenched, and they will be in abhorring to all flesh. That is because we have a free will still. God will not remove our free will in the new heavens and the new earth. Otherwise, we could become AI robots. We have to have a free will. I mean, do you want to have a robot that every day comes up to you and goes, I love you, I love you. It's like, yeah, I'm sick of it. Okay, that's the same thing. God doesn't want robots in the new heavens and the new earth. The good thing is we won't have the world. We won't have the flesh. We won't have the devil harassing us. But at the same time, we get to go take a peek and say, oh, don't touch that. <laughs> don't do that. You know, because God wants us to have a free will. He has to have something to motivate us. Now, look at Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death in victory. The Lord God is going to wipe away every tear from off all faces. The rebuke of his people he'll take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. In other words, the rebuke of Israel and the Jews and everybody hating them for the last 3,500 years, that's going to be gone. As a matter of fact, the book of Revelation, this very verse is what John saw. Look at what it says. He'll see, he saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And then I hear a loud voice coming from the throne. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He's going to dwell with them. They'll be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. And here it is. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Neither will there be mourning, nor crying, nor any more pain. The former things have passed away, and he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am going to make all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. When God says something, especially when he raises his hand himself and swears something's going to happen, it's going to happen. And this is where we see how temporary life is. People pass away all the time. You know, buildings pass away. Uh, everything passes away. But can you imagine the entire earth is going to pass away and all of the heavens are going to pass away and then he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. To me, that is just mind-boggling. 
And in one sense, I can hardly wait. But now let's look at Ezekiel 38, 1 through 3. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against who? Gog in the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, I'm against you, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Okay. A quiz, a test. I'll give away a prize if somebody knows the answer. But I don't think anybody does. So I'm safe. Who was Gog? Who did Gog descend from? A lot of people think Gog, you know, they know where Gog is, Russia or whatever. But who did Gog descend from? It was from one of the 12 tribes. It was from the firstborn, Reuben. You'll find that in Oh. Oh, I didn't put it down. I can't believe that. Oh yeah, First Chronicles 5. I did have it down. It was in First Chronicles chapter 5 where it lists the descendants. You'll see Gog descended from Reuben. And what's fascinating, Reuben didn't want to go in the promised land. He wanted nothing to do with the promised land. Remember, Reuben didn't want it. He stayed over in Assyria, that, that whole area. And I thought, wow, that's what you get for rejecting the promised land. I just thought that was fascinating. You might want to know who or where God came from. And as I said earlier, look at Revelation 20, 7 and 8. It says, when those thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison. He'll go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sands of the sea. Okay, well, after the thousand-year reign, there's going to be a whole lot of people born in a thousand years, and people are going to live a long time. And it's amazing. Again, Gog and Magog total the number 70, and 70 means all nations. And so this is why... All the nations from the four quarters of the earth are going to come again at the end of the millennial reign. Now, here in Deuteronomy 22, 8, it says, when you build a new house, you shall make a battlement for your roof. And what is the Hebrew word for roof? Gog. Exactly. And so, as I said, it is the battle of the strong house against the little sukkah. That's right there. This is a battle of those who are going to trust in what man builds versus trusting in what God builds. Uh, here we have the humility of the sukkah with its weak, unstable covering. And so the battle of the strong house has to do with pride versus the humility of the sukkah. Now, Gog represents the philosophy that man can insulate himself against the heavenly power of God. That's what Gog is. It's roof. It means you, it's a philosophy that you think you can shield yourself from what the heavens do. Magog, adding the mem in front, that means it's those who attempt to project this philosophy on earth. Okay? It's like the school system. <laughs> So Gog Magog are the forces of evil who are intent on destroying the people of God. I don't know if you heard, but someone uh, at a Kamala Harris rally yelled, Jesus is Lord, and then immediately she started bad-mouthing Christians. Just interesting. I'm not saying who to vote for. Okay. <laughs> um, in Habakkuk, Chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as what? The waters cover the sea. Wow. So the knowledge of the Lord is going to surround the whole world. And this is what's important. Back in Egypt, Israel is leaving Egypt. They had to make the choice to embrace freedom 
over having their government supply their basic needs, breaking the chains of government control over their lives. They got free. The leeks, the onions, the garlic, the cucumbers. They don't mind that all their children were thrown in the Nile. We want our government subsidy. And then when they got to the wilderness and they weren't supplied with all those things, they want to go back. There are a lot of people today that just want a basic income from the government and they can control them and they're happy. We're facing, it's the very same time that we are in right now. This was a turning point in the history of Israel, and this, I believe, is the same choice America right now is facing. Now, God well remembered that first night. Our perspective is our building of a shelter, but the other is God's willingness to provide his glory cloud to shelter us. When you think about it, Nisan, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, is what day in Nisan? Nisan 14 is Passover, Nisan 15, which is a full moon, and Sukkot begins on Tishri 15, exact opposite, six months apart. These are complete opposites, Passover and Sukkot. Well, because God does not want us to see the blessings we have as being a result of our hands, Sukkot is the feast of in gathering when we may think it was the work of our own hands and now we are safe and secure. But we have to realize it is only trusting in God. Sometimes when we get free at Passover and then everything goes great, Sukkot comes along living in the sukkah to remind us in our blessings, we're not the ones that brought this, God brought this. That's what's so important. That's why they're the opposite. One is you get free, but the other one is you're so blessed, you better not forget who freed you. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 through 18, it says, the Lord your God is going to raise up to you, who? A prophet from the midst of you, of your brothers, like me. You're going to listen to him, and this is according to all that you desired of the Lord your God in Mount Sinai or Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. We don't want to see this great fire anymore that I not die. Can you imagine? This was, I think, the biggest error in all of Israel's history when they said, we don't want to hear directly from God. We just want to hear from Moses. And to this day, I think that's a problem. They, they don't want to hear from God. They want to read the Talmud and all of what the rabbis say, what Moses say, but that's going to change. And it says, they have well said that which they have spoken, so I'm going to raise them up a prophet from among their brothers like you, Moses, and I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak to them all that I shall command him. This is why Yeshua said, I only speak what the Father tells me. There are some Christians today, well, we only do Jesus' commands. We don't do Father's commands. Well, he only spoke what the Father said. And now, so all of Israel was looking for the prophet that was prophesied by Moses. We'll look at John 7. Verse 37 through 40, it says, Now on the last and greatest day of the feast, this is the Feast of Tabernacles, Yeshua stood and he cries out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from within him will flow rivers of living waters. And so I got this river of living waters. And... Then it says, but he said this about the Spirit, which those believing in him were to receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Yeshua was not yet glorified. But look at this. Many of the multitude, when they heard these words, said, this is truly the prophet. They were referring back to Deuteronomy. They said, this is the one that Moses was 
prophesying about. Okay. And he's talking about living waters. And as I said the other day, what are they doing in September, October, during the Feast of Sukkot? They're praying for the rain because there hasn't been any rain at all for months. So here they are praying for the living water. And this is during the Feast of Tabernacles. Yeshua stands up and says, I am that living water. And then look at John 8, 6 through 8. The very next day, Shemini Yatzeret, Simchat Torah, they said, testing him, that they might have something to accuse him of. But Yeshua stooped down, wrote on the ground with his finger. But when they continued asking him, he looked up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone at her. And again, he stooped down. And with his finger, he continued to write on the ground. And then in John 8, 9, it says, when they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. Here they are. They're totally ashamed. Totally ashamed. And they start leaving one by one. But you know what? Just the day before, they had rejected the fountain of living waters. If you go to John 7, the soldiers that were supposed to arrest him, bring him to the scribes and Pharisees, they said, why haven't you brought him? And they said, well, did you hear how the, what he said and how all the people were acting? And they say, Oh, you don't know the Torah, okay? They forsook the fountain of living waters on the very day of the fountain fountain of living waters. Now comes Simchat Torah, and instead of rejoicing in the Torah, they're trying to use it to kill the adulterous woman. And now he's writing in the dirt. Do you ever wonder what he was writing in the dirt? I can tell you what he's writing in the dirt. It tells us. It's in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13 and 14. Oh, Lord, the hope of Israel, and the word hope is also mikvah which is where you cleanse yourself. All that forsake you will be ashamed. They that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they forsaken the Lord, the fountains of living waters. He was writing their names in the earth. And then the next verse is the adulterous woman saying, heal me, O Lord, and I'll be healed. Save me and I'll be saved for you are my praise. And he does. So right there, it tells you exactly what he was writing in the ground. Isn't that an amazing connection? This is why we have to make the connections between all these things. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 6 and 7, he said to me, it is done. I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. And he says, to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Well, guess where he gets this from? Isaiah 55, 1. It says, come, everyone who thirsts, come where? And guess what? The word of the Lord will be like the waters of the sea covering the earth. Whoever doesn't have any money, come and buy and eat. Buy wine and milk without money, without price. God gives everything freely but we need to learn to praise him and thank him and rejoice him for everything he gives to us instead of thinking it's our hand that got us these things. And then we see in Ezekiel 47, verse 2 through 5, then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward. Now, this is after Messiah has come. This is like at the very beginning of the millennial reign and Ezekiel's temple has been built. And it says, he led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looks which direction? East, okay. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. He brought me through the waters and the waters were to my ankles. Again, he measured another thousand cubits and brought me through the waters. And this time the water was to my knees. Again, he measured a thousand cubits and brought me through, and the waters were now to the loins. Afterward, he measured another thousand cubits, and it was now a river that I couldn't even pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. If you remember, think of the Temple Mount up on the Mount of Zion, Mount Moriah, okay? The Mount of Olives splits in two, 
and it's going to cut all the way through where the temple was, and everything's going to move north and south. It says it's going to be a great valley, okay? And what's going to happen is all the water is going to run east and west. It'll go, it says, toward the Mediterranean, and the other part goes down to the Dead Sea, which will be completely renewed and have fish again. And so that's what is coming to a planet near you. Let's stand. I'm so excited about starting next week with Bereshit. I have something really special I think you all will love and enjoy. Don't forget, if you want to go and come back, or we have the big barbecue party coming up after the second service.